right, just give me a second here. It says we're live. I'm just waiting for the live stream to update. Let's see when it updates. We'll be good to go. It says we're live. I'm just waiting. Y'all probably see me before I see me. So just hold on, everybody. All right, here we go. Cool. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's your brother, Brother Jay. It's Brother Jay again of SOG, Soldiers of God. Uh, here tonight, just continuance. Uh, thank y'all for coming through uh, to tonight's uh, live stream. Uh, hopefully, you know, be able to shed some light on some things and, and uh, help you brothers out and those in that in that movement and the heretical doctrine uh, that Lord's will convict you, give you information. You guys can go and look at it, uh, see what the scripture is saying, and, uh, and Lord's will come out of it. Uh, so before I get going, I'm going to introduce uh, some brothers here that's in the panel. Uh, might have one or two extra ones coming in. Um, I'm not sure they'll jump in. I'll introduce them when they jump in here. Um, hey, no problem. Hey, matter of fact, uh, Surreal or Jesus the Word or, or Brother Kim, if one of y'all can shoot J-Man uh, the link so he can come and listen to the show. I know his internet be acting kind of crazy sometimes. Um, if y'all got access to that somehow. Um, if not, just let me know on the side thing. I'll get it to him. But um, so, yeah, so on the panel uh, tonight, we got... Uh, representing Jesus is the word ministry. Mr. Jesus th is the word himself. Uh, you got to meet the mic, you know, introduce yourself to the people. What's up, guys? Jesus is the word. Um, I do ministry with the Hebrew Israelites. If you haven't seen my videos, you can go to my channel, uh, YouTube, Jesus is the word, and check me out. Awesome, awesome. We also got, we got here representing Shield Squad, uh, Brother Surreal. I know he in the background cooking some chicken uh today so uh yeah if you buy your phone bro you can unmute and say what's up to the people man what's up y'all making chicken again yeah. it's gonna be good <laughs> all right no problem bro and we got my brother here another member of sog soldiers of god uh brother kim you well in the building man you can unmute your mic bro say what's up to the people yeah what's going on y'all good to be back with you awesome awesome man uh, might have one or two more jumping through here when they show up. Um, I'll introduce them. Uh, first, I want to thank you guys for, uh, you know, uh, coming through and listening to the last live stream, the uh, yokes of iron around the neck. Uh, who else been through this curse? Um, I think it was pretty much a success. Um, got a lot of good feedback. Got some mixed reviews on it, of course. I expected that. Uh, but, um, you know, overall, it went well. The information got out and it helped a lot of people. Uh, Lord's will tonight, it'll be just a repeat. Um, I basically wanted to continue back or uh, continue from uh where i left off last time all right and venture down a couple more verses um just to put them in their you know cultural context of what what went on in the scripture so um for those of you that was here the last live stream uh we went over Deuteronomy 28 uh 48 um matter of fact and before i get right into it let me uh do like i did last time man address the people in the live chat yo what's going on brother clinton peace fam brother eber or ever if i jacked your name up man forgive me a dog, what's going on? J man, what's going on? Who will be saved? Lord's will, us all. I'm gonna say that every time I see your name, bro. <laughs> what's going on, bro? Thank y'all for coming through. Uh, you guys, you know, share the links to your, your Facebook, uh, social media accounts, man. Let people know that we live now. Um, I tagged people earlier, uh, but if you guys can, you know, share it on your page, uh, that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, so like I said, wanted to continue. Uh, from the last live stream dealing with Deuteronomy 28, 48 and venture on down to verses 49, 50, all the way down to 52. All right. Um, but um, as I was putting together this new uh, PowerPoint, I came across a couple of things. Uh, one, I want to address a comment um, that somebody did post um, under the live stream video from, from uh, the night before last. And I just wanted to show this particular comment because um, this actually highlights something that um, I see that as a, a, a problem. It actually kind of gets under my skin a little bit. Um, so let me uh, share my screen right quick so you guys can see this, and then I'll address this comment that this person left. Uh, the focus isn't so much on who, because I don't know who this is and who account that is, uh, but more on what they said. So let me do this. All right, let me let it update on the main screen. And uh, you guys should see it right now. All right, cool. So um, this was left under the video, uh, the last live stream, uh, the iron yokes, I mean, the yoke of iron upon their neck uh, until they're destroyed, as you guys can see up above. Um, but below by only as it is written, um, they sent me this 
comment or whatever case is. I'm gonna read this and I want to address it. It says, um, I really hate that this brother got involved and twisted up in IUIC lies or any one West camp because they all teach the same deceitful doctrine. Because now this brother is on the warpath to discredit their lies and them, and but in in turn is discrediting parts of the Bible that they used to mislead him. It's a sad effect and vicious cycle of confusion they are causing among the sheep. But whoa, get out Negroes before it's too late. All right, so I wanted to address this because um, a couple of things. Um, I, I, I see, and it, and it comes a lot from the moderate camps and, or those who's not a part of any camp, which the camps would call individualites. Uh, they would, when a, when a brother would lead the movement and deny being an Israelite, uh, because the scriptures don't line up. The person always equates that to, oh man, you know, he was in this one West or any, any camp or one West camp or whatever. Can they tell him lies? And, you know, it led this brother to confusion. And now he's just, you know, discrediting the, the Bible, you know, and what they taught him because they taught him some, you know, heretical doctrine or something like that. They always kind of make that appeal as if you went on the other side and became a moderate or an individual like that, as they would call them, that all of a sudden you would re you would really be in the truth then. Um, and, and I hear this comment all the time, uh, and this person made it in this comment section. I wanted to address it. Uh, going, I'm going to read the second half again, and then I'm going to give my response. It says, all, all these camps teach the same deceitful doctrine, which I would agree with. Because now this brother is on the war path to discredit their lies, more like expose them, um, and but in, in turn is discrediting parts of the Bible that they used to mislead him. Now, I don't know if only as it is written is listening live or they may see it afterwards, but my question would be to them um, or anybody that would think that about me or, you know, somebody who came out of the One West faction like Brother Kim Uel, or somebody like uh, Faithful to God who left the Hebrew Roots Movement or G-Con um, and, and various other brothers uh, who left this doctrine uh, and left it all behind because it, it was it was all a lie, all a lie. Um, if you're saying us letting that go is discrediting parts of the Bible, I want to know, what, well, what part of the Bible are we discrediting? Because last time I checked, all of us brothers deal with the entirety of the scriptures. We believe everything that's written in the Law and the Prophets. We accepted Christ, who the Law and the Prophets wrote about. And we go about teaching the doctrine that Christ and his apostles taught concerning the gospel and the doctrine out, uh, around it in terms of obeying the gospel. So I, I don't know what part of the Bible you're with somebody's discrediting. Um, and like I said, it's more about exposing the falsehood that we were in. You know, some brothers come out of the movement and they leave and you'll never hear from them again. They carry on with their lives. But every now and again, the Lord put the, the, the fire or, or zeal in some of us that we then turn around and let the people know all the things that we were taught, exposing the false doctrine that we was taught to hopefully um, cause brothers and sisters to be convicted or, or knowledgeable of this doctrine that they're in, that they may come out. So it's not a discrediting of the Bible. It's actually just pushing the Bible in its actual context or its meaning. meaning. Um, so then they said, it's a sad effect and vicious cycle of confusion they are causing among the sheep, but whoa, get out Negroes before it's too late. Now, this can go two ways. They could be saying, get out of them camps, Negroes, or they could be saying, get out of America, Negroes. That's that's what it could be talking about. But I'm, I'm going to pick the, the first, that it's talking about get out of these camp Negroes um, before it's too late. The fact that somebody says something like that, that lets me know they don't go by the true gospel. That lets me know they don't go by the true gospel when someone speaks that way. If it's about sin and you understand the gospel, there's no get out Negroes before it's too late or get out white man before it's too late or get out Asiatic man before it's too late. That, that you don't speak in those kind of distinctive terms as if we're all we're different when we're supposed to be one in Christ. So if someone's in sin, you just say, you know, come out of sin or, 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 or turn away from sin or turn away from wickedness or, or repent. That's how you would speak. Well, when people start speaking these coded words like get out Negroes or, uh, you know, or these camps or these one West camps, when people start speaking like that, you got to watch how they speak, man. So I wanted to address that comment because 
we get this kind of comments all the time those of us that leave these these groups um but somebody left it on the comment section so i wanted to address it that is it believe me i'm not confused none of these brothers on the on the, on the panel is confused regarding whether or not the black hebrews like doctrine is false or not we know it's false and that's the point of this live stream is to continue to show the falsehood and twisting and manipulating other scriptures that they do to spread the doctrine that they spread so uh i see brother faithful to god is in the building hey you can unmute your mic man address the people while i get the uh get this next thing up if you hear me or if you buy the computer hey peace is word remaining forever peace peace far sights what's going on bro all right i see uh far sights getting into my class <laughs> All right, let me get the uh, slides pulled up here. Let's give me a quick second, guys. All right. All right, let me share my screen again. All right. Is it to everybody? Thank y'all for y'all patience. All right, so of course, like any other live stream, when we're gonna show footage and all that kind of stuff uh, from different people's uh, YouTubes or whatever cases, we post this fair use notice uh so that it be known that we're not trying to make money off anything we're not trying to reproduce anything uh we're not trying to you know take somebody's work and resell it or something like that um this is strictly for educational purposes and so we post this fair use notice at the beginning so that it will be known all right so i made this short list right before i went live and i wanted to kind of expound on it before we get right into the first um footage all right black Hebrew israelites versus christ all right, these are some common things you would hear people say versus what Christ and the apostles say, right? So most black Hebrew Israelites will say, the curses identify God's chosen people, the children of God, right? Uh, but on the right side, you see, the scripture says the seed of promise as Isaac was are the children of God. The elect, the believers of both Jew and Gentiles are God's chosen people, according to Romans 9, 6 through 8, and Romans 8 and 14. All right, it's the seed of promise that is counted for the seed of Abraham and those that believe on Christ and walk in this and live in the spirit, walk in the spirit or led by the spirit, as it says, are the sons of God. None of those things have anything to do with your nationality in the flesh. All right. It's about who you are, who you're born of in the spirit. Another thing you would hear heard said is no other nation has been through all these curses. All right. Now, this is coming through, coming from a group of people who have not experienced half of the curses that's written in that chapter. But they're saying nobody else, no other nation has went through all these curses when the, when then themselves haven't been through it, right? So the script, they say no other nation has been through all these curses. On the right side, it says the curses have come upon all nations. We went over that in the last live stream. That's Deuteronomy 30 and seven. All nations had yokes of iron around their necks under King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, all nations, if you read from Genesis, on through have been scattered at one point or another uh by god and scattered throughout the um the earth just as israel was um you know all nations have gone through famines and pestilence uh where the lord would make the heaven uh the heavens and the earth like brass and and dust where he would hold the rain uh from them obviously causing them to go into severe famines and people perish because of lack of food we see that throughout the scriptures all right uh, we see the Lord judging all the nations, all right, whether removing them from the land, sending them into one captivity to a next, or judging another nation by the hands of another nation. God has been doing that since the beginning, all right? And the reason why he's judging people because they sinned against him. If no one sinned against God, there'd be no reason for judgment, all right? Uh, another thing you hear said is, you're a special people because you're an Israelite. But the scripture says, according to the gospel, you're a special people because God brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light by his great mercy and not because of who you are in the flesh. He remembers his promises, not who you are in the flesh. All right, you read this in 1 Peter 2, 6 through 10. And just to explain it, just in case anybody's kind of confused by the last statement, that he remembers his promises and now you are in the flesh. When you look back during uh, the Old Testament time when God has his chosen people or his first fruits uh, among the nations, um israel of the flesh the 12 sons of jacob and their descendants when they would when they would uh sin against god and he would remove from the land every time that he got ready to bring them back notice he never said he was bringing them back matter of fact before they got the land the first time 
he let them know it's not because of anything that y'all did that was so great or something y'all deserved this land of flowing with milk and honey. It's because of the promise he made to their fathers. And when Israel would sin and be removed from the land and he would bring them back to the land before he would bring them back, or when the prophets would be pleading for God to hear the cry of his people, they always said, remember the promise or the oath you made unto our fathers. Or God would say, I'm gonna bring you back because of the promise I made to your forefathers. None of it had to do with them because they were stiff necked and rebellious and broke the everlasting covenant. God's mercy upon them was because of him remembering his promise. So it was never about, oh, they're the 12 tribes, they're the 12 sons of Jacob, you know, they're Israelites of the flesh, and I have to do this for them. And you and you see the example of that when Israel sinned against God in the wilderness, and he was ready to wipe all of them out and start a new line through Moses. So God didn't care about who he was in the flesh. But what did Moses say? Remember the promise you made unto their fathers. And God remembered his promise. So God remembers his promises, not who you are in the flesh, because he's shown that doesn't matter. That don't hold no weight. That's why you see with John the Baptist and the Pharisees, you know, we're Abraham's seed. He said, don't say you're Abraham's seed, for God can raise up these stones to children of Abraham. You see Christ with the Pharisees. I know you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. So it's never about who you were in the flesh. It's never about who you were in the flesh. God remembers his promise. All right. The same thing with even the gospel itself. God didn't have to bestow his mercy upon us. He would be just in wiping all of us out because we've all sinned against him at one point or another. But what did the scripture say? He made a promise to Abraham. He made a promise to Abraham. He remembered his promises. All right. So let's move on. Now, I said I wanted to start off where I left off. Um, and as I was looking for new footage to show for this class, they mentioned something uh, similar to what we was going over the last class. And I want to play this excerpt right quick. All right. This is IUIC. Now, I want you to watch how slick this deceived IUIC member teaches Deuteronomy 28, 47, and 48. I want you to notice what he says to try to beguile the people into believing what it is he's spewing to them. I want you to take notice at it. And I want you to take notice at his mannerisms. All right. He's, he's speaking as if he, he really cares. He's fully persuaded in this doctrine he's in. That's why he's speaking that way. But he's he's speaking to the people as if, you know, I really care for you. And, you know, you're really the Israelites. And I'm really trying to wake you up. I want you to notice this. Here we go. Deuteronomy 28, verse 47. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 47. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Verse 48. Verse 48 Therefore shalt thou serve thy enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger and in thirst, and in nakedness and in want of all things. And he shall put a yoke of, uh, a yoke of iron upon thy necks until we have been destroyed. So because we didn't want to serve the Lord our God with joyfulness, gladness of the heart, and abundance of all things, God said that he would put, he would, we would have to serve our enemies. In, this is in the Bible. And one of all things, hunger, thirst, nakedness. Now our people are on food stamps. You know, we have, they put out a sign saying, you know, we accept the EBT, so on and so forth. But in order to get food stamps, it's based on the income of the family. The more money you make, the less food stamps you get. So what does that encourage? Well, I'll just stay down and make a little bit of food, a little bit of money, and I can get more food stamps. For certain now... This ain't my main cuss of my presentation, but I wanted to play this. Um, and, and any brother that want to comment on this after, after I'm done, you can before I get into these slides. Is I want you to notice how slick this brother was. He read the curse that thou shalt serve thy enemies in one of all uh, in, in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness. And this man brought up food stamps, and he said, food stamps. And he, and he gave the criteria of how food stamps work. For those that don't know how food stamps work, the more money you make, the less of it you get. 
because of the, the purpose of food stamps is to help those of low income. So obviously the ones who are lower income get more food stamps. That's how it works. So this brother said, what does that encourage? Oh, we'll just stay at the bottom and, and make a little money and then we can, um, you know, get the food stamps. See, we serve our enemy. That's what he said. That's the most foolish thing I've ever heard, man. Most people that's low income and, and, and needing food stamps, a lot of them are, you know, um, I have to say this language, baby mamas. A lot of them are baby mamas who has three, four, five kids. All right. You know, made the wrong decisions in life. But despite her wrong decisions, or whatever the case is, there are things put in place to help alleviate some of that weight that will be placed on her because of that wrong decision. So they give them food stamps to help, you know, offset the cost of what it would cost them normally to feed all those mouths. So they get food stamps. It's to help the low income family. That's the purpose of it. So obviously, people who make more money don't need as much help. It's the same thing as in the church. Everything was disputed based off everyone's needs. Even when you see in the wilderness in Exodus 16, when God dealt with the manna, even the manna, the people who had more mouths to feed took more manna when they went out to gather it. The ones who had least mouths to feed, they didn't get as much. They got enough to feed the mouths. So it's the same thing with food stamps. So I don't know why you bring up food stamps to try to say you're ser they're serving their enemies because of food stamps. Well, if that's serving your enemies because of food stamps, there's a lot of white people, what we call, you know, people call them trailer park trash and all that other stuff. You know, these derogatory terms and all that kind of stuff. That is, in some cases, lower income than a lot of black low incomes. And they get food stamps. You have higher echelon like the Kardashians. They don't need food stamps. They don't need help. They make millions. So, of course, they would get less. Most black people, if they had the option, they would make buku money. If, they, if somebody just gave them a blank check, they would write an unlimited amount of money that they can cash in. That they can cash in. So to say food stamps, you know, what does that encourage? You know, well, you know, we we're gonna make we're gonna make a little bit of money. Most people that own food stamps don't have a choice of how much money they make. A lot of them have jobs, but they're like waitresses at uh uh waffle house or something where they ain't really making much. So they need help. And that's what it's there for. It's it's help in, in uh certain cases to help people. All right. Um I know I used to I actually used to be on them. I actually used to be on them. So I, I, I know. Um, but these are the type of stuff. I played this because this is the type of stuff that they bring up. They say precept upon precept, but notice they read right through it and he freestyled what he thought it applied to. Instead of going to a precept according to their doctrine and showing what why serving your enemy in hunger and thirst or in nakedness and in one of all things. They don't do that. And that's how they deceive people with their doctrine. Um, I didn't know if somebody wanted to add something to that uh, before, right before I get, get going. Yeah, I'll add something real quick. Um, like you were saying, um, the majority of people on food stamps are, are white people. I mean, uh, statistically speaking, that's what it is. And so if we're using that interpretation that this is talking about food stamps, that verse in Deuteronomy 28, <clears throat> then that means white people underneath the curses, if that's the case. You know, so it's a horrible example because it actually works against them. Right. And then that's another example that Deuteronomy 30 and 7 is true. Mm -hmm. A lot of them like to bypass that and say that's talking about when Christ comes back. I don't know if anybody wants else want to say something real quick. If not, I'll go ahead in. All right, cool. So let's go ahead and move on in. Now we're going to move on to the, the, the point of tonight. As swift as an eagle flyer, not America. Well, let's see. Let's see what he's got to say first. Verse 49. Verse 49. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flyeth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. So as we were brought over here, we didn't obviously didn't come over here 
on our own free will for most of us. Um, our Native American and Hispanic brothers who are already over here. A nation from far away, halfway around the world, came over. You can imagine what was simple that they used, typically used. An eagle. So you see, America has the eagle. Spain has an eagle. Again, this is biblical prophecy that has come about. As swift as the eagle flies. So the eagle is a, a, a great uh, animal, a great beast that God had made. It has very great flight, very great precision. And that is something that all of these nations, the Nazis, use the eagle as a symbol. Verse 50. Verse 50, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. They didn't care if you were a baby, as we saw some of those other pictures, or if you were old. They were coming to take over. You can see in some of these pictures, they're even holding up a cross. A cross saying that it's they're, they're okay with this. They have misconstrued the word of God because they don't understand the word of God. It was given to us. But they've taken our words and twisted them. And they are coming in to destroy us. Our people had the land over here, but they came in and they conquered it. Right? Any mean by any means necessary. All right. So a couple of things. <clears throat> He's freestyling off the top of his head, and you could tell it. I don't know if anybody else can see it, but I can see it. It's freestyling off the top of his head. Also, notice when they show those images of eagles, they always show quotation mark who they believe is Esau. They only show white nations, white nations that use eagles. We're going to see something in, the, in a couple of slides concerning all that. But that's what they try to do. They, they use any, anything that they can to paint the narrative of the doctrine that they're trying to push. There could be a million nations that use eagles, but they're only going to focus on the white ones, the ones that they're going to say is Esau, so that they can paint America as being what Deuteronomy 28 and 49 is talking about in 50. All right, but we're going to see something. Now, the scripture said, this is an excerpt from Proverbs 4 and 7. All right, it talked about wisdom, and it tells you with all you're getting, get understanding. All right? Now, according to the black Hebrew Israelites, the curses are put upon us for a sign to show us we are the true Jews. This is based off of Deuteronomy 28 and 46 interpretation that they have. The problem is, if God uses these curses to identify your special nationality, why would God make it hard for you by placing all those same curses on all nations? This is an excerpt from Deuteronomy 30 and 7 when it says the curses would be upon all nations. So what, the, what that means is this. You're either Israel of the flesh or the enemy to the true Jews of the flesh. Meaning you can't identify a specific nationality by something all nations can identify with. If so, wouldn't that make you all one people? Hmm. Let's excerpt from 30, Deuteronomy 37 again. All the curses will be upon the enemies of Israel as well. So this is the image I got offline when you look up Deuteronomy 28, 49 through 50. Just on Google, this picture comes up. So I decided to include it because this is who they think it's talking about. The curses put upon put on the Jews, Deuteronomy 28, 49, and 50, America with the bald eagle and their army. Let's hear something. This is coming from the mouth of IUIC's deacon. And then we're going to get into my slides dealing with this very subject. Let's hear what he got to say about this. What is about? You know, verse 49. The Lord shall bring a nation. Against thee from far, from the end of the earth. The Bible says, God says, when I bring a nation against you from far, 
from here on the because a lot of people thinking when we get here, we speak English. We didn't speak English. That thing was putting on us. We didn't speak Spanish, that thing was putting on us. Me? I swear, as the ego. Read that again. I swear, as the ego. I got a question for you. Where is it? What is the sign of an ogre? What is the sign of an ogre? Read that again. I swear, as the ego. What was the sign of Spain? The eagle. What was the sign of mom? The eagle. The sign of America is the eagle. So who the hell is that? God is telling you exactly. He's talking about America. That's who the enemy is, brother. Read that again. That's, that's, a, God, that's, a big, that's a big clue right there. God is leaving you a big clue so you can wake up. Read that again. I swear, as the eagle fly. A nation whose song thou shalt not understand. That's why I told you we don't speak English. That's why the Bible says, you see what the God said? God said, nation, if he's done, you're not going to understand. Because when they show up in the borders of Africa, we didn't understand what they're saying. <sighs> oh, boy. All right. So, once again, these guys bring no quotation mark precepts out since you've got to have a precept to understand what the Bible is saying. But yet, to understand what these curses are talking about, you don't need a precept. You can just, you know, what's this person's, you know, symbol and, and piece it together that way. All right, well, we're going to find out what the whole point of this ego is. Now, so according to the Black Hebrews Light Movement, doctrine concerning Deuteronomy 28, 49 through 50, the nation from far is America. From the end of the earth is the Western Hemisphere. Like IUIC would say, all men was on the Eastern Hemisphere. What was the land that no man was at? The Western Hemisphere. So they say it's America, the Western Hemisphere. As swift as an eagle flyeth, as he just, you just heard from that deacon's mouth, is the white man's nations, or who they would say Esau, because they have an eagle as their national symbol, America being the latest. Whose tongue thou shalt not understand is English. That's what they say, right? So that's their breakdown for Deuteronomy 28, 49 through 50. The problem with this assertion is that the Bible gives us a time frame in which this curse was fulfilled already, way before America. Daniel 9 11 says, Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by the pardon, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse, and the curse he's referring to is Deuteronomy 28 15, which brings on all the other curses, is poured upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Now, I looked this up because I want to. I'm gonna go back to that curse, and I want you guys to notice something. Maybe you not might have had not noticed before. So here's English grammar rules. This is a semicolon. It's no accident that a semicolon is a, a period atop a comma. Like commas, semicolons indicate an audible pause. So anytime you see a semicolon, it, imagine somebody's just pausing in the middle of their sentence, like taking a breath or something, and then they're gonna begin again. Similar to those that read sheet music. You would have a rest or a quarter rest, noting that that's a period of time you either rest for a whole note or a half note before you start blowing your flute again. All right, it's to help you stay on beat. So it says, like commas, semicolons indicate an audible pause, slightly or longer than a commas, but short of a period's full stop. In English, a period means the thought is done. That's the end of your statement, end of your sentence. Now you're going to begin a new sentence or, or a new thought. All right. But if you see a semicolon, what's next is a continuance of what you just read. Now, here's a colon. A colon means that is to say, or here's what I mean. Colons and semicolons should never be used interchangeably. For example, if you're going to make a list, like, for example, if your mom said, get me the following things from the grocery store, you put a colon and then you will begin your list. Eggs, comma, blah, comma, blah, comma. That's how you would phrase it in English. But just as with a semicolon, a colon is not a period. It is not a full stop. It is not the end of your thought. So if someone uses a semicolon or a colon, know that the thing you're about to read right after that semicolon or colon is a continuance of what you're just reading. So in English grammar, a semicolon or colon 
This means semicolons, not the colons, is a thought, but instead continue it. So one thing they miss, the Lord said he would bring a nation against thee. When the Lord says this, uh, when the Lord says this, he is specifically saying that this nation would come against the Jews in their land. That's right, Jerusalem, not the west coast of Africa, and not America, for America is not the promised land. All right, so stop with that whole, our people had this land, and somebody from far came, and that fulfilled this prophecy. No, it didn't. America is not the promised land. It's not the land of milk and honey. And it's not the land God promised unto the forefathers. So stop with that. Not the west coast of Africa. The proof of this lies in verse 51, which is a continuance of 49 and 50. And 50. Notice the semicolons uh, uh, and, uh, and colon, I meant to add in there, at the end of those verses. This is not talking about some random places on the west side of Africa, but specifically dealing with the land of Israel that the Lord gave them. Now, let's go back to this curse. Excuse me. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee. All right. If somebody has their nation and another nation come against them, means they're coming, for example, if America went against China or went to war with Iraq, America goes to Iraq's land, where the Iraqis at, who they fighting. So if Israel's in their land and God said, I'm going to bring a nation against thee, in the context when we read verse 51, this is dealing with bringing this nation against the Jews who is at Jerusalem, not West side of Africa. So let's read this curse. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth. There also the other thing to, to mention, I meant to add it in there as a uh, little uh, parentheses thing is, when you read, you have to know the context in which earth is being used because when you read Genesis one, we call the earth and everything inside of it, the earth. But when you read Genesis one, the scriptures let you know God told the dry land to appear out of the waters and he called the dry land earth. So when the scripture can say from the end of the earth, it could be saying from the end of the land. Not always in the context of all the way on the other side of the world. That's not what it's always talking about. So you have to know the context and the verse is going to give us the context of what end of the land is. And when we get into the writings of the prophets. So it says from the end of the earth as swift as the eagle flyer. Now, for those that had seen my Revelations 1, 14 to 15, uh, um, Live stream I did a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a month ago on my page. Um, when you read in Revelation 1, when it says his head and his hairs is white like wool. White like wool. All right? It's letting you know, it's giving you the indicator of what you need to be paying attention to or what it's comparing. If I said, like I asked the other night on GCon's live stream, if I said, man, that joker right there, he black as night. You know I'm comparing that brother's skin tone to the darkness of nighttime, all right? If I said, yo, this frog is green like grass, you know I'm comparing the color of the frog to the color of green grass and not saying that this frog is the texture of grass, okay? You, you automatically know that I'm talking about the color, all right? Here, the Lord is comparing this nation that would come against the, the uh, Jews from far from the end of the earth or the end of the land as swift as the eagle flyeth, okay? As swift, and we're gonna get into, I'm gonna show you how swift an eagle is. A nation whose tongue thou shall not understand. A nation of fierce continents, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. But notice, I have it in red here, I don't have this one in red. Let me make that in red for the people that see it in the future. Here's a semicolon. This is continuing describing the same nation that he's talking about here. Then when you get to the end of 50, it's a colon. So what we're about to read is a continuance of verse 50. So the same nation. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee neither corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thine kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. Then it says in verse 52, I decided to add this. 
and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fence walls come down. Wherein thou trusted. Did the Jews trust in the west side of Africa? No, they sure trusted in the promised land, Jerusalem, the temple courts. They trusted in all that. That's where their gates was to lead into the city. Throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee. And we're going to get into what this besiege is, or a siege. It's a military tactic. He shall besiege thee in all thy gates, throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God have given thee. This is the context of that whole verse. This is the context of this curse. This is where it's taking place in the land which the Lord thy God have given thee. And what land did God give the Israelites? The land that flows with milk and honey, the land of Israel, Jerusalem, and the surrounding areas where they broke it off into the tribes. But specifically dealing with Jerusalem where the glory of the Lord was in that temple under that first covenant. That's what this whole thing is talking about. So let's look at the eagle for a moment. As swift as an eagle flyeth, Deuteronomy 28, 49 through 50. So the Lord said this nation would come from far as swift as an eagle flyeth. That's how swift the eagle flyeth. And we're going to get to the characteristics of, of an eagle because that, that video one right here, it has him in that tree, but it's not showing you how high up he is in that tree. All right, eagles, matter of fact, let me just move on the slide because my slide is actually going to let you know about this. But I've decided to show that video because as we read the scriptures, the Lord uses things that he created to explain something that he's going to do that got nothing to do with what he's using to explain what it is he's going to do. For example, the Lord can say, uh, as the four winds this and and uh, take you as a lion crouched in the blah blah. He'll talk that way through the mouths of the prophets, but it's not talking about a literal lion. It's not talking about literal wind. It's not talking about a literal eagle swooping down and grabbing all the all the, all the Jews. It's not talking about that. But he uses these things to describe what it is through the mouth of the prophets and those that have understanding uh, by the Spirit will understand what the prophets are talking about. So he says this nation would come from far, from one end of the earth or the end of the land as swift as an eagle flying. So let's get into the characteristics of this eagle. So it says, if an eagle in the scripture is talking about a national symbol, therefore identifying America as that eagle in Deuteronomy 28, 49, here's the problem we will quickly run into. Eagles have been used by many nations as national symbol. All right, these are just some. Albania, Armenia, Austria, Egypt, Germany, Ghana, Iceland, Indonesia, Iraq, Mexico, Moldova, Montenegro, Navarre, Nigeria, Palestine. As you guys look, these are different eagles. Eagles have different kinds or species, right, of the eagle kind. So they use all these nations, and it has to do with coat arms or military um type understanding when they're dealing with this eagle because it represents someone who's high up or rulership position who looks down upon his prey and so he uses this national symbol of eagle because of how fearless how tenacious um how uh, uh uh powerful eagles are i don't know if you guys have seen a video of it but eagle can literally pick up a deer can literally pick up a deer all right so Here's the thing. The Bible didn't say he shall come as swift as a bald eagle. The scripture says as swift as an eagle. E There's many different eagles. And if we're going to say this is talking about a national symbol, we're going to have a problem because there's many nations that uses the eagle as their symbol when it's dealing with coat of arms. Those are some. Here's another list. Panama, the Philippines, Poland. Romania, Russia, Serbia, Syria, United States, of course, Yemen, uh, Zambia. These nations use eagles as their national symbol. Either they still do now or they, or they used to. Okay, but the point is, is that this is not some symbol that's relegated to white people, white nations. And therefore, you can just say, oh, look, they're using an the eagle. So they're, they're this nation that is talking about. All right. You cannot, hey, can, I, can, I, can I interject real quick, brother? Yeah, yeah go ahead. 
Um, it's funny because, you know, they believe in that uh, faulty Dark Ages doctrine and the Byzantines use the eagle. Matter of fact, let me see if I can pull this up. <laughs> you know, because uh, if they're going to make the appeal to the eagle, then how do they get around the fact that in their worldview, you know, since, you know, the Israelites are, you know, somehow, uh, you know, the Byzantines were Israelites, but then meanwhile, they, they use the eagle as well. Look, I'll, I'll screen share it real quick. Okay, tell me if uh, you can see my screen. There you go. And that's one. I have more than this. You know, I could show how the eagle was used in Mesopotamia for different cultures. So I don't know where they're getting this idea that, you know, um, oh, well, you know, the eagle, uh, you know, the, the, the eagle represents Esau. But meanwhile, if you go to Isaiah 40, 31, you know, the eagle is used in reference to who? When it says, but they, shall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount upon wings as eagles. Now, this is talking about Israel. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And then here's another one. This is Deuteronomy uh, 32. In fact, I'll go ahead and start at verse 10. So Deuteronomy 32 and 10, it says, He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling uh, wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him. Now, actually... Let me read uh, nine because, it, you know, they'll try to, I know how they'll try to twist this. You know, try to make it seem, oh, see, that's talking about Esau there. No, this is talking about Israel. Look what it says. Verse nine. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. All right. Now look at this. He found him in the desert and in the waste howling wilderness, and he led him about, and he instructed him and kept him as the apple of his eye. Now look at 11. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So you mean to tell me that the Lord himself used a metaphor of an eagle for Israel and, and even for protection? But, you know, leave it up to them. They'll just make that be, oh, it's just Esau. Esau's the only one that, uh, you know, because they'll go to Obadiah and see where it says, uh, not realizing that that's a metaphor talking about how, you know, Edom in Mount Seir was up high. So clearly that's why that, sim that, that uh, uh, symbolism was being used. But yeah, but go right ahead, mother. I just wanted to bring that up. Cool, thanks. So as, as Faithful just showed you guys in the picture, and as this list shows you, you cannot say, oh, what symbol do they use? Oh, they use an the eagle. So, hey, that fulfills prophecy, you know, because eagle, swift as an eagle. God's giving you a clue. Well. Why would God make it so difficult and have all these other nations use eagles? Like, come on, man. You cannot do that. Keep the scriptures in their context. All right. It's comparing the swiftness or the, as swift as an eagle flyer in regarding to sending this nation against Israel. All right. And we're going to get even more into that. The eagle in Deuteronomy 2849 is not about a country whose national symbol is the eagle. Instead, it is concerning the characteristics of an eagle flying swiftly. Here's some characteristics of an eagle. Eagles see long distance, prey or enemies, because of their sharp vision, which is the strongest in the animal kingdom. They can spot another eagle soaring from 50 miles away. That's how keen their eyes are. They can spot out another bird, another eagle flying up to 10,000 feet in the air, that's how high eagles can get, or at least some kind of eagles, can get up there up to 10,000 feet in the air, and they can spot out another eagle flying 50 miles away. That's how keen their eye is. It's the sharpest, it's the strongest eye in the animal kingdom. Eagles are fearless. If you notice, just any normal birds, if there's a storm approaching, you see them all flying in herds to get away. But if you notice an eagle, an eagle, don't, he stays put. He spreads open his wings. He, he don't fly away because of the storm. He, he deals with the storm. He deals with the storm. He doesn't fly and, and head for cover away from the storm as other little birds, species. Eagles are tenacious birds. They will attack you. They will. And like I said, they can pick up. Eagles can pick up. A grown adult eagle can pick up a deer and pick it up in the air and fly away. That's how strong these things are. They can pick up a sheep, 
a lamb, whatever it is. That's how strong these birds are. Eagles fly very high in the sky, but can swiftly, 30 plus mile per hour flying, that's how fast they can go flying wise. So imagine the fastest human being running. Uh, I can't remember exactly who, what I, I used to know, but um, I don't know exactly how fast he clocks in terms of speed, but an eagle is faster than the fastest human being running. 30 miles per hour they can fly through the air. But they can swiftly land to the ground. When they close their wings or glide or do their gliding motion and glide downwardly, they can hit up to 200 miles per hour. If they're 10,000 feet up in the air, this bird, seeing 50 miles away, can spot out a prey on the ground, fold his wings or put them out like an airplane and head dive 200 miles an hour up to 200, 000, uh, 200 miles per hour in what they call a hunting dive. That's how swift an eagle flyeth. So the Lord is comparing how swift an eagle can move or fly when he's head diving down to catch his prey, which you guys see by the video. That bird held his wings out. He turned them a little bit inward just to slow him down just a little bit. He put them claws out and in one motion grabbed the fish and took right back off in the air. He didn't stop. That's how swift an eagle flies when he's coming to snatch up his prey. So what the Lord is talking about when he says from one end of the earth or one end of the land, as swift as an eagle flyer is letting Israel know how quickly God will bring this nation against them from far. Because remember, an eagle can see from far, 50 miles an hour, uh, 50 miles away, sharp, keen eye, strongest in the animal kingdom. Did not Babylon rule all nations? They were the strongest. It took God to bring them down. So here comes. Babylon, kind of getting ahead of myself, but that's what it's talking about. Here comes Babylon from far, from one end of the earth, as swift as an eagle fly, how the Lord moved them in on the Israelites so quickly to remove them out of the land when Israel transgressed him. What nation fulfilled this according to the scriptures? The truth about Deuteronomy 28, 49 through 50. The nation for far is Babylon, the Chaldeans, the, the daughter of the Chaldeans. All right, from the end of the earth, land, you read this in Genesis 1, or if you look into the underlying text, which I meant to put on here, but it lets you know that it means earth or it means land. All right, and so you have to let the context tell you how this word is being used. And as we get into the words of the prophets, it's going to make it even more clear. From the, from the end of the earth is north of Jerusalem from a far land. As swift as an eagle flyeth, meaning... This nation will quickly come upon you and remove you from the land as swift as an eagle diving to attack his prey. Whose tongue thou shalt not understand, the tongue of the Chaldeans, which is much different than the Hebrew tongue, Jacob and Esau spoke. All right. I'm going to say this again. The last one. All right, cool. It says, whose tongue... Thou shalt not understand the tongue of the Chaldeans, which is much different than the Hebrew tongue Jacob and Esau spoke. They grew up in the same house. They have the same father, same mother. They spoke the same language in that household. And they always knew each other. And when you look at where Edom is in regards to Jerusalem, they're not from the end of the earth. Number one, they're brothers. They always knew each other. They are not, matter of fact, my next slide points it out, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see, let me see. Now, I'm going to mention it now. When I get to the slide, then we'll see it again. The other thing to note, Esau is not the ancient nation. All right? When we get into the words of the prophet, it talks about that ancient nation that God was bringing against, against them. Esau is not the ancient nation because Esau and Jacob's nations started at the same time. At the same time. They were twins. They were born the same day. Their nations began at the same time. Esau is not the ancient nation that God used to bring against Israel to fulfill Deuteronomy 28, 49 uh, through 50. Quick second. 
Yeah, let me uh, yeah, let me yeah, just yeah. jump in real quick, right. man. It's funny because in Deuteronomy, we actually see the Israelites having to go to the Edomites. Remember when they were trying to pass through? Right. And they wouldn't let them? So how could that possibly be about Edom if they literally just had an encounter with Edom? You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Like they, they, so what language did they speak when they spoke to Edom? Right. If they weren't supposed to understand the language. I mean, this is just, this is just be common sense, right? But <laughs> Right, exactly. Right. So what this is talking about, once again, as we saw in the last teaching or last live stream uh, two days ago, this is dealing with King Nebuchadnezzar and his sons and his son's sons, the kingdom of Babylon, the daughter of the ancient nation Babylon, the daughter of the Chaldeans. All right. Now let's get into the words of the prophets to see this. This is Jeremiah 5, 14 through 15. It says, wherefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. It is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. Neither do you understand what they say. And just as me and Faithful God just brought out, how many interactions did Jacob have with Esau throughout the scriptures? Esau even dwelt among Israel. You had one Edomite during, the, uh, I think it was during Saul's reign, who was actually over the Benjamites. If I'm, if I'm wrong about that, uh, about that time frame, uh, let me know. But they dwelt among them. They grew up in the same house. They had the same mother and father, spoke the same language. So the same language that Esau spoke to his father when he would feed, uh, 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 when they would feed um, Isaac his meals, as the scriptures say in Genesis, how Esau was a hunter and how his father loved his meat that he would catch. The same language Esau spoke to his father when Jacob came to get the birthright, spoke the same language. So it says, a nation from far, it is a mighty nation, an ancient nation, a nation whose language thou knowest not. So I didn't put in the slide, but when you guys get a chance, go read Genesis chapter 10, I believe it is, when God divided the nations and gave them their inheritance, their lands, and how they were split up according to their, their nations, their languages, uh, and, and their uh, families. All right? The children of the Chaldeans, I did not go with the children of uh, that the line in which Abraham, I mean, I'm sorry, not Abraham, but the tribe that the uh, 12 tribes would come through. All right. They did not go with them. So let me go and move on. It says an ancient nation, meaning a nation from way before Israel was founded. Edom is automatically disqualified as being that ancient nation because Jacob and Esau were twins. And their nations began at the same time. Plus, they spoke the same tongue growing up in the same house. This is Jeremiah 6, 22 through 23. Thus saith the Lord, behold, a people cometh from the north country. Now, I, I see other camps would say the north country. That's talking about North America. Well, we find out. Behold, a people cometh from the north country. And a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea. And they ride upon horses, set in array as men of war against thee, O daughter of Zion. Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar was north of Jerusalem. Edom was south of Jerusalem. Isaiah 33, 19. Listen to what he says here. This is very important. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came thee unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They come from far, a far country unto me, even from Babylon. Then he said, uh, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All that is in mine house they have seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. 
Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord, and thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, Good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. He said, Moreover, for there shall be peace and truth in my days. This is Jeremiah 52, 1 through 11. Zedekiah was one and 20 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hamutal, uh, Ham the daughter of Jeremiah of Limna. And he did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that Joachim had done. For through the anger of the Lord, it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah, till he had cast them out of his presence, meaning removed them out of the land, that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of, king of Babylon. Now, if y'all remember the last, uh, last thing we did, when we read the prophet Jeremiah, when he went and prophesied against the nations, uh, the word of the Lord, and the word of the Lord said, and the nation that do not bow their necks and place it under the yoke of King Nebuchadnezzar to serve him, that nation would God remove out of their lands and consume them by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, his servant. So here, Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So, so what do you think will happen? Let's read on. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army, against Jerusalem, and pitched against it, and built forts, uh, uh, read that again, and pitched against it, and built forts against it round about. This is a siege. For those that don't know what a siege is, those that may not have been in the military, a siege is a military operation in which enemy forces surround a town or building, cutting off essential supplies with the aim of compelling the surrender of those inside. So they surrounded the city, Babylon did, they seized it, all right? And they sat there until it besieged the city. So it says, they pitched against it and built forts against it round about, which is a siege. So the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. And in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the famine was sore in the city. Why? Because they, the siege, cut off food supply. The famine was sore in the city so that there was no bread for the people of the land. Then the city was broken up. And all the men of the war fled, men of war fled, sorry, and went forth out of the city by night by the, by the way of the gate between the, between the two walls, which was by the king's garden. Now the Chaldeans were by the city round about, and they went by the way of the plain. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued after the king and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. They then they took the king. Now that's filling another curse. And carried him up unto the king of Babylon to Riblah in Zedekiah, I mean, in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. And the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. He slew also all the princes of Judah in Riblah. Then he put out the eyes of Zedekiah and the king of Babylon bound him in chains and carried him to Babylon and put him in prison to the day of his death. We're going to revisit this because this is um, this is describing the very scriptures that we read in Jeremiah 28 about the besieging the walls in which you trusted, uh, the, the uh, besieging the city, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, coming against you nation from far, ancient nation, as swift as an eagle, how fast they came upon them. All right, even fulfilling another curse when they talked about how they would take your king that you've that you've uh, uh, raised up or placed over yourselves. This is Isaiah 47, 1 through 6. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Uncover thy locks 
Make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance and I will not meet thee as a man. As for our redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Sit thou silent and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called the lady of kingdoms. I was wroth with my people. I have polluted my inheritance and given them into thine hand. Notice this. Thou didst show them no mercy upon the ancient, other translations let you know it's talking about the elderly folks. Remember, the curse was they shall not, uh, they won't have mercy on the old, neither show favor unto the young. We saw one scripture where they slew the sons or the children of the king, all right, showing no favor to the young, how they castrated them and made them eunuchs in the king's palace. And here we're seeing them not having mercy on the elderly, but has made verily heavily laid thy yoke. So upon the ancient elderly hast thou verily laid thy yoke. And that yoke is that yoke of iron we read in Jeremiah in the last, in last, last stream, how he ruled the nations, how he smoked them in anger. This is Jeremiah 48, 40 to 42. For thus saith the Lord, behold, he shall fly, <coughs> excuse me, he shall fly as an eagle, and he sh and shall spread his wings over Moab. When you guys read the book of Jeremiah 27, 28. It'll give you the list in verse and even chapter 23. It shows you the list of the ruler, the kings who ruled different provinces of the land, which would cover the, the earth or the land, and how all the nations were made subjected to King Nebuchadnezzar. As you read through the prophet Jeremiah, as you read through the chapters, it'll be prophesying against one nation, then it move against prophesying against another nation, then another nation, then another nation on how God was going to judge them. And eventually he brought them under the heavy iron yoke. Of Nebuchadnezzar, but it says, Behold, he shall fly as an eagle and shall spread his wings over Moab. Koriath is taken, and the strongholds are surprised. And the mighty men hearts in Moab at that day shall be as the heart of a woman in her pains. And Moab shall be destroyed from being a people. Wait a minute. So Israel wasn't the only people destroyed from being a people in the Bible. It said, Moab shall be destroyed from being a people. Because he have magnified himself against the Lord. This once again shows, number one, that the other nations can sin, regardless whether or not they receive Moses' laws or not at Sinai. Also, it shows that God is paying attention and he judged them because of sin. And God don't judge people for sin for no purpose. The purpose is for them to repent, just as with Nineveh. So it says, more shall be destroyed from being a people. This shows. Once again, Deuteronomy 30 and 7 in effect, that all these curses, because Moab prior to that then came against Israel. Edom prior to then came against Israel. Ammon prior to then came against uh, Israel. Egypt prior to then came, came against Egypt. I mean, came against Israel. And what did God say about the enemies of Israel that would come against them? He would place all these curses upon thy enemies, those that persecuted thee. Here we see, yes, there was a, 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 a Punishment of Israel destroying them from being a people, removing them from the land, discontinuing them from their heritage of the land and that covenant that God had made with them. Also, Moab shall be destroyed from being a people because he had magnified himself against the Lord. Isaiah 33 19. You will no longer see a fierce people, a people of unintelligent speech which no one comprehends of a stammering tongue, which no man or which no one understands. This is all still dealing with Babylon, daughter of the Chaldeans. Ezekiel 17, three saying, thus saith the Lord God, a great eagle with great wings, long pinions and a full plumage of many colors came to Lebanon and took away the top of the cedar. This is still dealing and describing King Nebuchadnezzar when he was sent against Jerusalem. Showing how he's compared to this eagle. And when the, and when the Lord says, as swift as an eagle flyer, how it is showing you the characteristics of an eagle, as we've shown in the video, of how swift an eagle flies when it goes to attack its prey. So now let's go back and revisit 
Deuteronomy 28 again. So the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far. The nation then at that time wasn't revealed through the mouth of, uh, of Moses. That's right in this. But it was revealed through the mouths of the prophets before the Lord sent that nation. But Moses prophesied about a nation coming from far from the end of the earth or the end of the land. And the prophet Jeremiah let you know that it was talking about an ancient nation from the northern country, which is the kingdom of Babylon. Then it says from the end of the earth or the end of the land as swift as the eagle flyeth. That's how he came and conquered. They seized the, the city, cut off the food supply, caused a famine, and they besieged the wall. They besieged the walls. They didn't show favor to the to the young. They castrated them, made them units, and they and they killed some of them. They didn't uh, uh, lay a, a easy yoke on the elderly, being that they were old. No, they laid a heavy yoke on them. So it says that swift as an eagle flying, showing how quickly the Lord would come bring this nation against Israel if they transgressed him. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, which is not Edom, for they spoke the same tongue and grew up in the same house. And Edom is not the ancient nation, for Jacob and Esau's nations began at the same time. A nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce continents, uh, which shall not regard the person of old, meaning they ain't gonna regard them, meaning, oh man, you know, and you old, man, you like 70 years old. Hey, you know, I'm gonna make an elderly home, man. And you know, you just take it easy because you almost out of here anyway. No, man, you old, I don't care. Heavy yoke. I'm gonna make you a bricklayer or, or masoner or something like that. Build my temple. They didn't regard the old. Nor show favor to the young. Oh, you guys are young. You guys got a whole life to live. You got to get a healthy family. No, they castrated them, made them eunuchs and killed a lot of them. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep until he have destroyed thee. Why is that? I want to just reference to. Uh, Give me a quick second. I want to reference to a script that I read in the last live stream to show you that what this is talking about. And I'm gonna pull it over on my screen. Just give me a quick second. As I pull this up. Just give me a quick second. I just want to pull it up. Find my spot here. Okay, here we go. Let me pull it over here. All right, so this is uh, uh Jeremiah 27. All right, I'm going to start at verse um, five. All right, this is the Lord told Jeremiah to take bonds and yokes of wood. All right, and, and the context show you it was wood at first. That's what Jeremiah had, and the pro false prophet Hannah and I broke it off. Then the Lord said it would turn into yokes of iron. All right, so he had bonds and yokes made of wood, and the Lord told him to send it to Edom, Moab, uh, Tyrus, Zidon, the Ammonites. All right, and these covered the prophecies in which they ruled. All right, it says, send it to them and tell them. This is verse five. I have made the earth, the man, and the beast that are upon the ground by my great power and by my outstretched arm and have given it, talking about the earth, man, and the beast, unto whom it seemed me unto me. And now have I given all these, these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him, and the nations shall serve him and his son, and his son's sons, until the very time of his land come, and then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. And it shall come to pass that the nation and kingdom, which will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and that will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish, saith the Lord, with the sword, and with the famine, and with the pestilence, until I have consumed them, by his hand. Now I pull that up because the scripture said, and he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, or the increase of thine kind, or flocks of thy sheep until he have destroyed thee. Why? Because the Lord had given all these things, the earth, the man, and the beast into the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon and the Babylonians. That's why they would not leave Israel, either corn, wine or oil or increase of thine kind 
or flocks of thy sheep and will eat the fruit of thy land because Israel had vine vineyards and all that stuff planted. But they was going to be driven out the land and another people would come and take over. So they would not leave them uh, corn, wine, oil, increase of kind, flocks of sheep. They would eat the fruit of the cattle and the fruit of the land until you have destroyed thee, meaning have removed you. Then verse 2 says, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates. We read that in the book of Jeremiah, how that when Babylon came, they made a siege around Jerusalem. And it, and it caused a famine because they cut off this food supply by their siege. And then they besieged the, and they besieged the city. It said, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates. Not west, west side of Africa, for you didn't have no gates. You didn't have no land. According to the black Hebrew Israelites, they were sold by Arabs to the Africans and were slaves to Africans who then turned around and sold them to the white man. So there was no period of time in the middle where the black Hebrew Israelites made a new city with new walls, uh, a, a new land that God gave them in Africa somewhere, on the west side of Africa. None of that happened according to their timeline. They were always slaves according to their timeline. So by the Arabs to the Africans, sub-Saharan slave trade, they were African slaves who then turned them over to the white man who put them on ships and brought them over here. That's the way their, their, their logic goes. So not only did they not have a siege or a siege around thy gates, for they were not in their land. Not only did they not, uh, 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 someone would come and eat the fruit of thy land for they weren't in it, now they leave them corn, wine, or oil because of their vineyards, which was in their land, which they were not in already. Not only would they not be besieged in Jerusalem because they weren't there, according to their timeline, it said, throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all our gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Did God give the Israelites the west coast of Africa? No, he did not. That is not the promised land. It's not the land of milk and honey. That is not the land he promised unto the fathers. The setting of this whole besiege, of this taking over the vineyards and the cattle and all the fruits of the land till he's destroyed thee, as swift as an eagle fly coming to you from the north, uh, northern country, from the end of the land, all pointed to King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. All pointed to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now you got to see when you go throughout the New Testament, why you don't see Christ or the apostles talking like the black Hebrew Israelites and talking about the things that the black Hebrew Israelites are focusing on, that most black Hebrew Israelites are focusing on. They're, they're quoting this as if it's talking about America instead of simply going to do their own doctrine by getting a precept and seeing that this had already been taking place in the scriptures. And we can actually read about this. And as I said before, and then, and then I'm going to cut the mics on and let brothers speak if they want to say anything, is regarding all these curses. These were curses of the law, for breaking the law of Moses or that covenant that God made with them. Deuteronomy 28, 15, it said, it, matter of fact, let's just pull it up right quick just to show you. This was all connected. A quick second. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Deuteronomy 28. Let's read verse one about if they would have got some blessings. And it shall come to pass if thou shalt if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, this day, this day, meaning by the mouth of Moses this day, commandments that he told him to teach him in Deuteronomy 4, this day that was received this day from Sinai. And that the Lord that God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Verse 15, but it shall come to pass if thou will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, this day, by the mouth of Moses this day, Receive that Sinai this day, first covenant this day. That all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So the curses of Deuteronomy 28 is in connection to the first 
covenant. It's in connection to the first covenant. If these Hebrew Israelites, spe I'm specifically talking about the ones who say they believe on Christ now. The ones who say they believe on Christ. If they believe on Christ, there is absolutely no way they are under the curses of the first covenant for to believe on Christ is being under the new covenant. So you do not identify yourself by curses of a covenant you're not under, supposedly. You identify yourself by the blessings of the new covenant in which you should be under. That's why I showed the comparison chart at the beginning. The curses proves you're God's chosen people. You're God's chosen people, a special people. These curses identify that. But is that what Christ said? No, Christ said, one, who is my mother, my brother, and my sister? Those that do the will of my father, which is in heaven, which is to believe on him and to love your neighbor as yourself. What else did Christ say? You shall know that and they shall know you're my disciples indeed by what? How you love one another. None of these indicators. What What else did it say about a adoption of sons? It's through faith. Is faith a curse? No. How, how are you the seed of Abraham? How are you the children of God? By being born again of the spirit as Isaac was being the seed of promise. That's what Galatians 3 lets you know. That's what uh, Romans 9 tells you, that the promises count for the seed. So all these identifiers of who's God's people has nothing to do with curses, nothing to do with it. So as you guys, as, as brought out in these slides, Deuteronomy 28, 48, when it talked about the iron yokes, it was upon the neck of all the nations. You read that in Jeremiah 27. Uh, we read a little bit at, Today, uh, verse 49, 50, 51, 52, it's all pointing at King Nebuchadnezzar and the besiege of Jerusalem that, that came upon them as swift as an eagle flyer from an ancient nation of northern land that came against them as swift as an eagle flyer, the strongest kingdom on the earth at that time, just as an eagle has the strongest sight in the animal kingdom and he can see from far. That's why God used that comparison to an eagle because of the characteristics of the eagle that he created. So hopefully that brought uh, to light, you brothers and sisters, you cannot look at that and go, oh, well, oh gosh, they got a symbol that's an eagle. Many nations had eagles. You cannot look at that. You cannot look at that. You have to read the scriptures because if you keep reading them verses and stop stopping like they do, and then start asking you questions instead of keep reading, then the scripture will paint where the location that this besiege would happen. Not on the west side of Africa, but in Jerusalem. So uh, if any brothers want to say anything, uh, you guys can go ahead and, uh, uh, and unmute and, uh, and and say, you know, say peace. Yeah, I don't know if anybody wants to say anything, but uh, um, yeah, go ahead, brother. Yeah, yeah uh, brother, come here. We can hear you, man. Go ahead, man. All right, I'm going to go ahead. Yeah, I want y'all to just let me know if I'm breaking up because my Wi-Fi is kind of, you know, choppy. So yeah, you could. Um, I just wanted to touch on on verse forty nine again. Um, I'm clear right now. Yeah, you good. You good. You clear. All right. Um, yeah, I wanted to touch on verse twenty nine on verse uh forty nine again because, like y'all was saying, um, the ego thing is is symbolic. It's not talking about a literal picture of an eagle that the whoever the nation was coming against Israel they're not going to have a literal depiction of an eagle that's not what it's talking about it, it was symbolic of a, a predatory animal but I'm gonna share my screen real quick and let me know if y'all can see it because I want to show you something real quick uh give me one second all right all right I'll present you you say you're showing a picture all right now I'm gonna show a couple of things can you okay. see my screen yeah, I'm presenting you right quick. All right, they should see it. All right, cool. So this is Deuteronomy 28 and verse 49, all right? Now, this is the Hebrew word here for the eagle, right? So I'm going to click this right here. So it's Nishkir, right? Eagle. But let's look at the longer definition. <clears throat> so it says, eagle, from an unused root meaning to lacerate, the eagle or other large bird of prey. So in other words, there's a broader context to so that Hebrew word eagle to where it can refer to another large bird of prey. 
So now somebody would argue that this is referring to not even an ego, but it's something else. So I'm going to read a couple of articles to, um, as to what other people would say that that word Dashir means because it has multiple meanings. Now, I'm not saying that the word, the definition eagle is wrong, but I'm just saying that Deuteronomy 2849 is not talking about a literal picture of an eagle that they were coming with. So I'm going to read these articles real quick and let me know if y'all can see it. I'm going to be real quick. Um, yeah, you're good to go, man. So now a lot of people are familiar with this site because IOIC uses this a lot, at least the, you know, support the little conspiracy theories. But this is an article on the word of the day. So the Hebrew written share that we just saw, it says the great Hebrew battle of the birds, right? That the harrowing tale of how Nishir became eagle only to be reduced to the vulture once again. So now it says, y'all can see my screen, right? Yep, you see it. All right, so now it says, I'm gonna just read a little bit because this is, this is kind of long. So it says, no discussion in the academy of the Hebrew language was as heated as the discussion concerning what bird Nishir is. Now, like I said again, Nishir is the Hebrew word for what we would see eagle as in the KJV. And it says, and to some extent, the battle still wages on with confusion waging among the people as to which it is, eagle or vulture. Officially, as we shall see, a Nishir is a vulture. But Aksa is really in the street what bird is found on the flags of Egypt, Mexico, and several other countries. And they'll probably say Nishir. Uh, Americai, though in fact the eagle is correctly referred to as Ait. The word Nishir appears 27 times in the Bible where it clearly means vulture. Still, the first translators of the Bible from Hebrew and Aramaic, the Greek translators that created the Septuagint, got it wrong and wrote Aitos, which is Greek, which is the Greek word for eagle. The same switch took place in post biblical Hebrew texts. One second. The same switch took place in post-biblical Hebrew text, as is clear by the fact that a Roman legion is referred to by its symbol. The eagle using the word Nishir in the Talmud. The rabbis don't discuss eagles much during the Middle Ages, but from time to time, rabbinic students also call Nashirim. And great rabbis, especially the Rambam, are referred to as Hanashir Hagadol, the great eagle. They most probably did not mean a vulture, as the hapless birds were reviled in Europe, unlike in the East. When science books began to be written in Hebrew in the 18th century, the, tra the tradition of using the word Nishir to mean eagle continued. And the article goes on to discuss how, you know, the tradition of using the word Nishir to mean eagle continues and then it switched back, so on and so forth. So now the reason that I'm reading this is because I wanted to, to show some evidence that that word Nishir can also mean vulture. So this is another article. It's from this website called the Zutor. Now the Zutor sounds kind of crazy, Basically, just you know, a website, but I think this is a rabbi. Um, and basically, what he does is he discusses the, uh, how the Hebrew text talks about animals. Um, and so, this is what he has to say on the identity of the Nishir. One of the most famous birds in the Torah is the Nishir, the king of birds. Although many assume that this is the eagle, the identity of the Nishir is a as we shall see, it seems more likely that it refers to a vulture, specifically the griffin vulture. This spectacular bird has a wingspan that can measure eight feet and is the most magnificent bird of prey in Israel. Now, that whole article goes on to explain a few things. I'm not gonna read the entire thing. I'm gonna show two more things real quick. Two more things because the article mentioned the griffin vulture, right? Uh, actually, no, nah, that's on it. So I'm going to just forget about that because I don't have it up on me. But here's the last thing I'm going to show. So just to support that, if you look at Deuteronomy 20 and verse 49 in the NLT, which is the New Living Translation, it isn't a tra it's a translation that I like. I mean, uh, you don't have to use this one, but here's what it says. It says, the Lord will bring a distant, a distant nation against you from the end of the earth and it will swoop down on you like a vulture. It is a nation whose language you do not understand. So you see, instead of using the word eagle, it uses the word a vulture. Now, the point that I'm trying to make with all of this is that that Hebrew word nishir, in a broader context, it just means a bird of prey. Hence, the symbolism in Deuteronomy 20, verse 49. It's not talking about a literal eagle. It didn't matter what their coat of arms or their flag was. It could, it could have been a pigeon on the flag. It doesn't matter. The fact is it was a predatory nation Therefore, the Bible uses a predatory bird 
to symbolize a nation that was coming against the Jews. Hence, any nation that has the eagle as their coat of arms or on the flag or whatever, which is more than just the white picture, isn't talking about that. Obviously, the brothers went through the scriptures to show you what it's talking about, but it's the symbolism of a predatory bird, not a literal picture of an eagle. Yeah, I'm gonna just let your brothers come and stop sharing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, man. Um, and I, real quick, brother Jay, could you show the? Uh, dude, I put the link in the uh, side chat. Oh my God, brother. And, 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 and you know the the thing that uh, the brother Kemuel said is definitely true in terms of how it could be defined. I mean, it could be, it could technically be either or. Um, you know, so it could go both ways. Um, but what he said was the, the most important thing was that it was a predatory flying creature, right? So what's being conveyed is that this animal is going to swoop down upon them. Well, not this animal. The nation is symbolically going to swoop down upon them as this animal that flies is going to swoop down upon its prey. Or, you know. Uh, so, yeah, so if you could, yeah, this is a Sumerian. So if you can look at the top, uh, the very top one, top left, you know, we, we noticed that they even had these like animals that you know they use symbolically to represent uh, their, I guess you could say their their deities, right? And they would call these the Anunnaki, right? So this is this is the kind of thing that I really don't get, you know, like they act like cultures didn't have the symbology of 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 you know uh, eagles or vultures or whatever the case may be. It's like you know, hawks, falcons, I mean, you name it. You know, all these flying creatures. And somehow it's only equated to Edom. Isn't that the irony? But then as we saw earlier, where the symbology is now applied to Israel, right? Where Israel is being uh, referred to as, uh, you know, with like the characteristics of a flying creature, an eagle, vulture, however you want to look at it. And then we see another passage where the same thing is being applied when it comes to the Lord as a you know protective sign for the nation of israel in uh, deuteronomy 32 how do they get around that and i guess i would ask you guys uh since both of you were former members of one western camps like when you would hear the breakdown for obadiah when they try to make the appeal to the to the eagle in that in that context right uh, however a person wants to take the uh, animal whether it's eagle vulture but cl clearly they're using the eagle right so how would you guys reconcile that in light of Deuteronomy 32 and then the, the passage in Isaiah, you know, in reference to Israel? Or, or would you? <laughs> That's the question. Right. In reference to the Obadiah 1 and 4 they like to go to? Yeah, you know the one that, yeah, yeah. exactly. The one that they say, um, you, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Uh, yeah, I got pulled up for you. Uh, okay, you got it. So... <clears throat> Concerning Obadiah 1 and 4, um, you probably already know, but people that don't know it, um, basically, this is basically how the breakdown goes. They apply this to America, right? Not that, you know, Edom itself was like it was never destroyed scripturally. Um, so it was like Edom just kind of just did their thing, ruled forever and ever. And this destruction that this is talking about is regarding America. So they say, mm -hmm. though you build your high, though you build high, like the eagle they say yeah you know white man they like them high riser buildings they like those high buildings they like living in the hills on you know, mountains somehow the other nations yeah right buildings. exactly Though you set your nest right. among the stars they got those uh satellites out there among the stars in the in, the, in space they're the only nation that do that white man got satellites in the space so it said though you set your nest among the stars from there will i bring you down so when the scripture talks about how the heavens are shaking and, and how the stars fall and all that kind of stuff in Revelations, uh, they, they say when Christ comes back, basically, we're going to start seeing, you know, the stars, we're going to see the satellites falling back to earth. Um, basically, it's almost like the earth will go off grid, basically, because the internet, all that stuff is going to be destroyed in that, in that moment. Um, so they, they, apply, they apply it to America, and they, and they talk about this high like an eagle, uh, reference to them living in mountains or like high buildings and all that other stuff even though you know Ammon or or moab have you you know whichever one they think they is uh have the tallest buildings in the world but you know so uh we'll just yeah we're gonna look at that um so you know look at the empire state building or something 
But or, or how about this? How Ishmael? You know what is it? The tallest building in the world is in uh, if I'm not mistaken, Dubai right now. Uh, what is it? The, the, the Burj Khalifa, I think it is. One of them places. Yeah. You know, but uh, you know, we're not going to tell everybody that Ishmael <laughs> has the tallest building. Right. You know, the tallest high rise. So that's how it's, that's how it's um, you know, that's how Obadiah one is uh explain you know to go with their you know they pair this with isaiah 14 and revelations 13 and 10 of course um and so uh that's how that's rectified now the other ones when it talks about you know israel and or description it talks about you know mount up as wings like eagle stuff you know they they i haven't heard them really read all the scriptures like that but just knowing how they are those scriptures they would get common sense back and, and they would know Oh, you know, just talking metaphorically and talking about how, you know, Israel's going to be redeemed or protected by God or something like that. Um, but then when it comes to these other references like Deuteronomy 28, 49 um, and I, Obadiah and, and all this other stuff, they they kind of venture off into their whole, you know, space theology type things and, uh, and and just start painting a picture that the Bible's not talking about. Right. And then the irony is, again, uh, if you look at Isaiah 40, 31. Uh, if you could go back to that again, my brother, and then go to Deuteronomy 32, 9 through 11. So it would be Isaiah 40 and 31 and Deuteronomy uh, 32, 9 through 11. So those two verses, uh, those two uh, examples. What was the first one? I'm sorry. Yeah, Isaiah 40 and 31. So this is clearly in reference to Israel. But you got to get the King James. Yeah, there you go. All right. This is Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Right. And then the second one is in Deuteronomy 32, uh, 9 through 11. Now, we already went through these, but I, sometimes you have to repeat this for a, a lot of them to kind of catch it because I don't think they'll catch it the first time. I'm not talking about the audience, by the way. I'm talking about uh, future One Westers who will watch this video uh, you know, hopefully in curiosity and then realize that, oh man, like my camp isn't telling me this kind of stuff. All right. right. So uh, start at verse nine. All right. Two hundred thirty-two and nine. For the, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirred up her nest, Wait, wait, as a what? As an eagle stirreth up her nest, right, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. Actually, read 12 too. All right. So the Lord alone did leave him, lead him, and there was no strange God with him. So metaphorically, this eagle is being equated with the Lord. Now, granted, it's saying a her, but you have to also understand, you know, the syntax and the Hebrew and all that. It's not saying that God is a woman. No. For those Hebrew Israelites that like to hold to extreme views and, you know, they make the Holy Spirit a feminine and, you know, it's, it's being used metaphorically, symbolically. It's a figure of speech. It's, it's symbolic of God's, uh, you know, protective nature over the nation of Israel. And yet... Why is this language being used if the eagle or however, you know, whatever bird they think it is, is somehow being equated with Esau? It's, it's amazing to me, though, that these verses are in the Bible in reference to Israel, and yet they'll conveniently overlook these passages. But they'll go to that passage where they're in Obadiah and then try to make something out of it, right? Make a mountain out of a molehill because they see the word eagle and then try to tie it in, as you guys said, with all these examples of eagles and um, you know, in, in crests and emblems and, you know, as if other nations, uh, you know, non-white nations didn't have the eagle, as you pointed out in the list that you gave my brother Jay, you know, didn't have that same symbol. I mean, my goodness, man. I mean, they, they, they think that the people in Ghana are, are now somehow, or, the, you know, Israelites, or at least some of the people, I don't know how they even worked that one out. And, and yet, don't they have an eagle uh, on their flag? Right? Wasn't Ghana one of the nations that had an eagle, if I'm not mistaken? Yep. Ghana. yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's, um, I don't know, man. It's, it's crazy to me to think that this is the level of silliness that we're having to deal with with a lot of the, the breakdowns that they're using. 
this is this is this is easily debunkable stuff, right? This is stuff that it's just it amazes me to think that that somebody would look at that and you know try to find confirmation bias around that. But that's just you know that's just how I look at it. But um, you know, but uh, you know, uh, but uh, brother Kemio, now when you were in your camp. Because I think Jay, um, I think you had shared your thoughts that now actually, you know, when you were in IUIC, Jay, did you ever encounter these passages in scripture? And if you did, like what were your thoughts? Like, would you just overlook them? Like, was it just like you would gloss over them? And I guess, you know, Kemu, I would ask you the same thing. Would you guys just overlook these passages? Man, yes, and or you didn't really read it. Um, because this this is this is how it is. <clears throat> you you have your Saturday class, which you get like three hours worth of notes, which you plan on going to look over. But then you have classes going on three times a day, seven days a week, and usually they want you to catch at least three, right? So you got the weekly notes. Then you have can't win a one on Wednesday, or in my case in Atlanta, it was two times a week. So you have both of these these period of times. Um and then you and then you write back at Saturday the next time, let alone if there's like a triple Sabbath or double Sabbath or something. So then you got all these notes piled up that you're expected to study. But then when you go study, you don't know where to start. So you rely on the precept packet. So you only end up studying what was on the precept packet. So that's kind of how it is. You're venturing off and kind of just reading random scriptures or whatever cases. It can happen, but it's, it's, it's few because you're normally just refreshing yourself with the doctrine you're already being taught versus just reading the scripture casually um, and, and allowing the, the spirit to, to show you things. And if the spirit did try to start showing you some stuff, some stuff that contradict what you've been taught, you have two things against you. One, you're sunned by the, uh, and those that don't know about being sunned by somebody, basically uh, you will see there's flaws in the doctrine, but then they'll say, hey bro, how long you been here? How long you been here? You'd be like uh, two, three, four years, maybe five years. And then they be like, so you telling me that you in five years got more experience and knowledge than those of combined 70 plus years of experience? And then they sun you, basically you don't know nothing. So then you go back and you just wait for the breakdown from the leadership. So uh, that's how it goes, man. You're, you're, you're regulated in how you kind of go about understanding the Bible and reading it. Completely contradicting, for example, what Paul tells Timothy, right? <laughs> You know, because of his youth, remember that they were trying to yep. trying to doubt him, right? But um, this is and what I, I don't. That's the hypocrisy yeah. thing about that because they'll quote this, the reading in uh, the apocrypha with the story of uh, Susanna when uh, when the elders passed false judgment and the Lord raised up the spirit in the young Daniel. They'll read that, but but if somebody saw some flaw in their doctrine, they're gonna sun you, bro. Right. And uh, the brother Kemuel, man, so what was your experience like, man, being in a different camp, but obviously a, a camp that splintered off from the camp that Jay was a part of? What, what were your uh, experiences in terms of looking at things like this, man? You know, like if you would see passages like that. I mean, it, it was basically the same thing for me. Like you almost have to, like with some scriptures, like you don't think about it. So for me, when I was in the camp, I never thought about, well, why does the scripture also, you know, symbolically compares God to an ego? I never thought about that. I guess, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, ultimately it's because you're, you're blinded, but I mean, I don't know. It's, it's almost because these dudes, they force you to take the Bible. The Bible is like, let's just say like a college level textbook and they force you to almost read it with like a, a preschool lens, so to, so to speak. Uh, so they just destroy all the symbolism, all the figures of speech. They just destroy all the, the literary devices that the scriptures use and you just see it for something that's so distorted it's almost like you just completely ignore common sense like mm -hmm. after a certain amount of time you know what it's talking about anymore you know so, so for me i just i would ignore some things i still could remember like back when i was in the camp i would try because i would sit down and try to come up with arguments just in case i would encounter them while i was talking to what i would call back then an unbeliever i mean not believing in my heresy <clears throat> but like for example like I never knew what I would say if someone would ask me, what about all the non-white nations that had, you know, eagle on their, an, an eagle on their coat of arms or on their flag or something like that, or 
I guess I would just say, well, maybe they're following the white man, but it's such a simple, crazy <laughs> response. Like, you just make yourself sound ignorant. Right. But I would sit down and try to find answers to these things. I would even, I remember, I would even try to find answers to, if someone asks you how you're in slavery today, what do you want to say? And I would literally try to find like comparisons and little witty statements and proverbs that I could say to prove that black people are in slavery. Like I remember doing this. And so I would try to like write them down and memorize them. So in the event that I'm in an argument, I could prove we some slaves. And then I could use Deuteronomy 28 to support it. But I also got some extra biblical material. So that's what I would do. Hey, what, what would you say? What did you use? What's some of the stuff you used to say? You, you, <laughs> right. A slave? <laughs> I don't know, bro. Like I can't even remember at this point. But sometimes I would say stuff like, like I would, I would use an athlete, or I would say, I would use like the example of mental slavery or something. I can't remember what I would really say, but <laughs> just something kind of, you know, the basic, yeah. generic black nationalistic stuff. It would be something did, like that. Did you use water bill? Water bill? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been going to Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta, y'all gotta, y'all gotta let everybody out there know what that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bro, I remember that one. That's a. <laughs> I know we we would always use that one when we were talking about um, Baruch three and eight. I think it was Baruch three and eight, right? Subject to payments. Yeah. And everybody, like, yeah, you gotta pay a water bill. You gotta pay a light bill. So you were slave. <laughs> like, yeah. Bro. Then somebody would come and say, "Well, ain't, ain't everybody you got pay a water bill?" Then then your cop out would be, "See, but Israel's supposed to be a, above all the nations. We ain't supposed to be paying nobody nothing." <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Bro, and it was hard for me because, like I said. I'm from the Bahamas, so I would have to tweak the arguments to f- water. Like the white man doesn't provide us water in the Bahamas, so I would have to tweak the arguments to show how the white man has us in slavery in the Bahamas, which is so hard. So I'd have to try and sit down to figure out these things, man. So I would just twist the scriptures up, basically. You know, <laughs> man, that's like I'm like I'm like really trying to take this in. It's like so so you're basically. The whole time that you're in there, any time that you see anything that might contradict the precept package, you'll find yourself eventually fighting against the scriptures. Would that be a, a fair assessment? Yeah. You, you, at some point, you'll, you'll just be like pitting scripture against scripture. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, man, that's that. See, and to me, that's the troubling aspect is because you have people in there that are literally just going off of what the so-called eldership are telling them, right? So they tell them, well, this is the breakdown. If you don't like it, you get out, right? That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But would, would, would that also be a fair assessment for uh, both of the respective camps that you guys were members of, where if you didn't go with the breakdown, you got out, basically? Yeah, that was your only option. Um, yeah, or at least stay silent about your not agreeing, but you still have to kind of go along with it as if you believe it. Um, because if you push back mm-hmm. too much, like, for example, let's say you went to some, some leaders in your local school and uh let's just say for example i'm gonna use the most obvious thing uh let's say you know during the new moon thing right when they changed the doctrine if if i saw something which i did and i did go ask questions but let's say i went and was like hey something wrong about this new moon thing so first they depending on who you go to because some leaders are horrible with people um somebody might try to sit down and give you that same breakdown so let's say you listen to the breakdown and then you come back the next week like Man, you know, look, I, you know, I, I looked at the breakdown. There's something off because blah, 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 blah. So then you might say, well, can I speak up to somebody up the chain or something? They might even refer you to somebody up the chain. Or they might tell you, you know, why, brother, or, you know, getting into your, in your throat um, and ask you how long and sun you, um, how long you've been there. Um, and, you know, you, you ain't been here long enough, you know, stay with the, stay with the milk. You know, you, you understand. Um, and so... If you keep pushing hard enough and you keep complaining about it, then you only got two options. One, you either be quiet or I you shut up and kind of sit there and go with the flow. Like I was told, you know, you know, just, you know, if if you don't agree and something's not right, you know, do both. Do do both. <laughs> so uh, that's what I was told. But uh, you either get with the program or. As they did with the year 2000 prophecy. Uh, if you don't, you know, teach this thing or you don't agree, you got to get up out there. So that's the, that's the same thing because they're going to apply uh, the script, Romans 16, 17 to you. Um, you know, mark those that cause division and stuff against the doctrine or whatever the case is. 
um, and avoid them. So if you don't agree with the doctrine of the of the school and you got a problem and you keep voicing it, you're going to either have to leave or they're going to kick you out. That's that's your only ends. There's no way you're going to be able to stay in there. You know, it's funny that Romans 16, uh, the appeal to Romans 16, 17, that would have been used against them if they would have existed during the time of the apostles. They would have been the ones on the outside looking in, you know, because the churches set up by the apostles definitely were not going to let that that nonsense fly that these camps teach. They would have been the heretics. Right. They would have been the very people that would have been cast out. It's amazing, though, man. But uh, and so, um, you know, to kind of, uh, you know, touch on the whole issue of, you know, Deuteronomy uh, 2849 again. You know, if somebody, if did anybody ever come to you guys when you were in your respective camps and bring up some of the things that we've spoken of tonight, that we've, we've talked about tonight? Did anybody ever bring anything like that up? Um, and I, I, or not necessarily even at the campsite, but just online and interactions with other people. Um, prior to either of you coming out, did anybody ever present these things to you guys? Uh, with me, never. Um, that's why it's so it's so important the stuff that we do because, I mean, I tell you, you just had this small group of, of you know apologists focusing specifically on the Hebrew Israelite movement. I mean, no one really takes those guys seriously, so you never really hear. I guess you can say like actual, those sort of like apologetic arguments against the heresy that they're saying. Like you, I didn't hear it, you know, until recently. The first video that I ever watched that made Hebrew Israelites look bad and sort of made me rethink everything was the James White video for me. Um, before that, I had never heard any sort of opposing arguments exposing the heresy ever. Mm. And for me, it was never, um, I, I was aware there was somebody out there. It probably was you, Faithful to God. <laughs> I was aware there was somebody out there, some some like mysterious group out there that was talking about IEC, making videos and stuff. I knew other camps was doing it, but it was always relegated to the hating on IUIC. But um, if it wasn't dealing with GMS or somebody that, of course, IUIC members knows don't like IUIC, um, it, it was always spoken in some like meta, not metaphor, but some kind of mysterious thing where. Like Deacon Asaph, he was he would say almost every Sabbath about these people that's singing something against the truth, and uh, you know they're coming after us because uh, you know we got the truth, and they they can't stop this truth. That's right, you know. So we would get that, but they would never tell us who these people was. And so uh, I knew some mysterious person was out there doing it, but I never knew who it was. And the very first video I saw myself um, of somebody coming against IRC, of course, is when Marcus left. And did that uh, thing with vocab. That's the first time I ever heard of a vocab, uh, of a vocab Malone. Um, that was the first time I heard somebody who came out of the movement um, and you know came out and, and said something against it. And of course, I was still in it at the time, so I remember how that whole backlash for him was. You know, we was told to avoid him and stuff. We was told we was weak, effeminate men if we let Marcus deceive us and take us out of the truth. Um, you know, of course, you know, vocab the white man. Um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, of course, you know, being a coon, all this other stuff that they say about, you know, me today or Kim today, you know, or even, even, uh, even you faithful, you know, I don't know how dark you are, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, for us, that's real dark. They, they oh, you say even surreal. Or yeah, like surreal. Con, yeah. So, um, uh, the same thing he said about Marcus and, um, uh, that was the very first time that I witnessed, not necessarily somebody bringing forth arguments. He mentioned some stuff, but it was, it was, somebody who came out of the movement that was speaking against it that I myself saw. And um, I, I couldn't, you know, my conscience, of course, I was scared to be deceived and be a weak effeminate man. I wouldn't watch it. Um, and I didn't, I didn't watch it until I actually left the movement. So, mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, that, you know, that's the case for a lot of brothers. You know, they're, they're scared into staying in that doctrine that they actually believe if they leave that, they leave the truth. If they let go of their nationality and all that kind of stuff, they're not God's people. Um, and, and of course, if they're not in an Israelite camp, who else is going to be keeping these laws, statute and commandments? So um, th those things are used to, to keep them bound, or like the apostle said, a yoke of bondage. That's exactly what it is. Um, so, yeah, for me, man, it wasn't until I got out and the first apologetic, 
apologet you know apologetics type uh deal i saw uh, was um i saw a little bit of the james white um video and how you know foolish that made uh recall matter of fact the funny the timing of that happened was in my period of time when i left the movement i didn't let go of the doctrine so in my midst of kind of finding the trying to find a new moon the, the, the moon of the, the, the count feast days too i was actually listening to various camps and gocc was one of them and um i was listening to their little stuff about fallen angels and all that kind of stuff and they brought up the book of enoch so i went and bought it and right around the time it was one teacher i was watching i was like something ain't right man and then um and shortly after that i saw the james white thing uh and i was like man come on bro and so uh you know because i'm thinking you know hebrew is like you know God mm-hmm. only gave them the knowledge. Everybody else got false knowledge. Here's a white man. You're supposed to be demolishing him, you know. So you know that's the mindset I had at the time. But that was around the same time when I was listening to Ricard and them. Um, when I actually saw the James White thing, and of course the next time I saw somebody really going after them is once I met you guys and we, and we started doing our thing. So um, yeah, man. Yeah, and um, surreal. I know that you've actually dealt with this topic as well. You know, you've dealt with Deuteronomy 28. So uh, what are your thoughts, man? And also, you know, what are your feelings about some of these faulty appeals that the uh, the camps use? Are you there, Surreal? You might have ate that chicken and gone to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Um, and Zcon is another one who's also uh, dealt with, uh, you know, the uh, faulty appeal to Deuteronomy 28 and everything like that. But um. I must say, man, I'm definitely happy to see you brothers doing your due diligence and studying and uh, bringing this information out to show the people who might be on the fence in some of these camps that this, the breakdowns are really debunkable. It's really built upon sandcastles. It's it's like really bad information. Um, You know, just faulty appeals to things that can easily be shown to be false. And I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward, man. And I and I definitely must salute the two of you. Um, you know, definitely a great job, man. Definitely appreciate it, bro. And definitely appreciate your brother coming through. You know, lending in your your words, and uh, you know, and then coming through, and everybody else out there that that tuned in and was patient and stick stick with to the end. You know, definitely appreciate the Lord's will. Uh, of course, you guys will see any updates if anything else goes down um, on my channel, wherever the case is. But I definitely thank y'all for coming through. Uh, everybody listening in. Let me see who uh, in, the, in the live chat still just kind of say thanks to everybody. Thanks, Sister Mariah. Uh, brother uh, Elikas. Hey, man, I'm pretty sure I jacked your name up, man. Far Sights, of course. Built for Speed. What's going on, bro? Uh, Sister Nicole, what's going on? His word remaining forever. Hey, what's going on? Sister Faith Lane, Brother Brian, what's going on, bro? A Dog, of course. Brother Eddie, <clears throat> what's going on, bro? Yaharam, Yahawada. Hey, what's going on, bro? Peace. If I'm jacking up y'all names, just know I'm from the South and I speak English, bro. <laughs> All right, so uh, what else? Uh, what's going on, Brandon Ashley? Definitely appreciate it. I think someone asked a question in the, in the chat. Oh, okay. In the oh, in the live chat or in the back chat? Yeah. No, no, the live chat. Sorry. Okay. Does anyone remember the IOC versus Southwest Christian? I used to blog for the parish. Group. Hey, yeah, I was actually with them, man, during that debate. I was I was part of the Austin school, and the leader was actually mad with me that I didn't go. Um, <laughs> and so. Um, yeah, I remember that they made it. They called it the debate of the of the year and all that. Made the little flyers, and they went out there and debated. You know, old men. You know, nothing against old men, but they went and debated people that didn't know their arguments. Um, and so, uh, so of course, you know, me being in there, I'm thinking they splattered these guys. But, um, but I remember that debate, man. I remember the whole uproar they did about that. And uh, funny coming from people that talk about they don't have time to debate and all that kind of stuff, but they keep making room to debate people that don't know their arguments uh they'll, they'll do a debate on the radio in africa somewhere they'll do a debate obviously with a christian theology school that won't know their arguments like that they did one with uh 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 this is when the former deacon shaki was with them they did a debate uh with a christian church down there in texas um they keep debating these guys that don't know their arguments i'm waiting for the day 
I win for the day and I hope it comes soon. Uh, and I don't want somebody that afterwards people are gonna go, oh, you spoke to the wrong guy. I want to speak to the right guy. All right. I want to speak, have a sit down live on air with an IYC leader. I don't care who he is, uh, just a leader. All right, because those are the ones that's teaching the people below them this doctrine. I got a couple of questions. They may or may not want to talk to me uh, because I'm an outcast to them. Uh, but um, I would like to do that. You know, they sit down and talk with everybody else. So how, why not talk with me and let's have a discussion. But, uh, you know, so for people that say, you know, um, I know they got to get the OK from the top up to talk to somebody about their doctrine. Um, that they're out in the streets preaching, but when somebody want to have a sit down with them, it's, you know, we got to get the okay. Um, so I, I know that has to go down. You got to go up the chain and get the okay from the leaders. Um, but if you can get the okay to defend y'all heresy, um, I would like to sit down with y'all and have uh, a discussion. All right. IUIC versus a, a former IUIC. All right. No, I make a video. Then y'all make a video somewhere down the line, subliminally addressing me um but let's 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 do each other um you know we can do it live on air man we can do it live on air a discussion you can bring out many people you want and let me know and then uh and of course i'll bring my guys y'all already know who my guys are so um you know i hope that happens i don't know if it will i think it's a long shot especially dealing with who it is that i was part of and you know my whole claim in there um so but i want to thank y'all for, um, if anybody got any other questions y'all want to say in the in the live chat, go ahead and put it in there. Uh, Sister Mai, Joey, what's going on? Yo, what's going on, Brother Kev? Hey, thanks. Appreciate it, bro. Appreciate it. Yeah, if anybody else had a question in the live chat, go ahead and put it. If not, then uh, then go ahead and end this in Lord's will. We'll see y'all next time. So I'll probably I'll give it like a minute. I'll make a I'll I'll give it like a minute for anybody to say or make a statement or something like that. You know. But I definitely appreciate the support of y'all coming and watching. Hopefully, you know, it helped y'all show y'all that this ain't talking about a national symbol of a nation, but this was the Lord using the characteristics of something that he created, a carnal thing, just as he did in the law, how he would use cardinal ordinances to teach them something that had nothing to do with that particular. Order, or, uh, ordinance, like for example, something carnal, a uh, carnal ordinance, physical circumcision, all right, of the flesh, all right. But it was pointed towards something that had nothing to do with the male, you know, cutting of his skin. But it was all a foreshadow of Christ and what it is that he would accomplish his death, burial, resurrection, the pain he would go through, um, him being the seed of Abraham, all of that stuff pointed towards Christ. The same thing with when you look into even the, uh, uh, you know, the, the feast days, you know, like a uh, Passover and the lamb using an actual, an actual lamb, a carnal fleshly lamb, slaughtering it. And it got to be, you know, in the first year without blemish and all that stuff. Carnal ordinance to lead you unto Christ. It had nothing to do with a literal lamb, but the lamb of God. Um, so the same thing with this eagle. As swift as an eagle flyer, using the, the characteristics of a carnal thing he created, which is the eagle or the bird or the fowl of the air. Um, to talk about something that had nothing to do with a bird, all right, but it had to deal with a nation and how swift they would come and remove Israel out of the land just as an eagle swoops down without stopping and take up his prey and, and take it afar off and destroys it. But check it, check your hangouts chat. I sent you some info in reference to this eagle video. All right, cool. If any brother want to um say something real fast, let me check that back chat to see what yeah. that is. If it's something lengthy, then um. Uh, we address it next time but yeah go ahead no i was just gonna say um uh, you know very quickly you know if maybe you and uh Kemua would possibly share the gospel message and, and maybe send a message out to anybody out there who might watch this in the future you know to let them know why they need to get out of that cult you know get away not just from them but whoever it could be a gms member it could be Anybody, anybody who's caught up with the one Westers, you know, why do they need to get away? You know, if uh, you and the, the brother Kim, you could uh, let everybody out there know as former members why they need to get out. Yeah, yeah go ahead, uh, Kim. All right, bro. Yeah, I'll sum it up real quick. Um, 
basically the, the whole point of the gospel of the good news is this. It's the fact that Jesus Christ, or if you don't want to call him Jesus Christ, you call him Yahweh Shai, whatever. Doesn't matter. But in English, I say Jesus Christ, right? <clears throat> the Son of God, who is literally God, the Messiah. He died for our sins, appeasing the wrath of God because of God's laws that we broke. Christ literally died for our sins. And so our sins was imputed to him and his righteousness, because he kept the laws perfectly, was imputed to us so that we might be made, <coughs> we might be made right in the sight of God. So that we might be made, we can be reconciled to God. That's the good news. The good news is that our Messiah has completely saved us, not made us savable, not, well, he just died so that we could get forgiveness and then we save ourselves. No, he has completely and utterly saved us, his elect. That's the good news. The good news is that we obtain salvation through him and only him. The reason that it's so important for you to get away from the heresy is because they preach another gospel. They preach another Christ. It is not the gospel that's contained in the, in the Bible. It's not. It's a complete heresy that was, for the most part, as you can see, it was a response to most likely, most likely the white supremacy that was going on at the time. Who knows? Who knows what's the reason for it? Ultimately, it stems from the enemy, from Satan. It is not the gospel. And everyone that the voices that are watching these videos, because people do watch, I know, I get the messages. Please, I'm begging you, leave that movement. You don't have to come out and make a public video. You don't have to do this stuff. But put your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, so no one has an excuse. You heard it. Leave that movement. Or, as it says in Galatians chapter 1, you will be accursed because you are promoting another gospel. And that's the message. Right. And just to add to that piece, um, to be accursed for preaching another gospel, <clears throat> the true gospel of God is the very power of God. All right. It's the, the, the power to save. All right. It's the faith in Christ in which will save us. Um, it's the way in which we shall live. As scripture say, the just shall live by faith. But how can they hear? Right. Let's let's you know, uh, there's a preacher, you know, now how shall he uh, go unless he was sent and all this stuff. And, and those that bring the gospel to someone. Right. So but if you bring in a false gospel. Then you bring those people a false hope, a false faith. All right. And though they may think they believe in Christ. They believe in a false Christ because the Christ, for example, that IRC teaches hates white people. The Christ that they teach only came for the 12 tribes. The Christ that they teach didn't want, don't want you to marry other nations. The, uh, the Christ that they teach um, it has, is racist, like they said. He's racist and God's a bigot and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's the Christ that they teach. And it shows in their fruits. Now, to them, they think because they're gaining more members or going over in Africa or whatever the case is, that they're gaining ground and God is blessing them and stuff like that. Did y'all forget what Satan said to Christ in the wilderness when Christ went to be tempted? When he took him on the high mountain and showed him all the kings of the earth. And he said, if you bow down to me, I'll give you all of this. Satan is the prince of this world. These brothers, sisters out there, you might see somebody like, for example, I do gospel music. I do music that is about the, the gospel. Then you have somebody that's out there that may do songs about, you know, stripping in the club or something like that. And they got millions of dollars. They're getting way out there. And the guy that's talking about the gospel and repenting and, and believe on Christ is over here in the corner somewhere. Now, the person that's making all this money and, 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 and gaining all this wealth in the world or this fame or this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, men looking up to him and all this stuff because of his stature, he, he may think God has blessed him. Oh, God is with me. Look at that. That's why you have these artists that's big time and they're singing these satanic songs. They always talk about walk by faith or God bless and all this other stuff. And they're like, what? That, that, that don't even... Dude, the way you look don't even line, don't even make sense with you talking about walk by faith. But they think that they're being blessed by God because of what they're doing and what they've been acquiring because of their talents that they have. All right. Which they did receive from God, but they're using it for the wrong purposes. 
So the same thing with IOIC because they got, you know, they all, you know, with their their uh pretty uh ninja outfits, getting all these schools, getting all this money, traveling, you know, taking the profits where no profit has ever gone, waking up a bunch of these people that they say ain't even Israelites, but they over there. Then so they think that God has blessed that. They think God is on their side because of that, because of the things that they're acquiring or or how it looks, forgetting that you can get the world's riches and be of Satan. So they're forgetting that. They're equating all the stuff they're gaining to blessings from God. So don't get blindsided by that type of stuff. That stuff is a facade to keep you in that doctrine, that heresy. I know because they brought it up to me when I was getting ready to leave. Before I got ready to leave, the officer told me, or the captain and the officer told me, look at, you know, look at IRC. Look how, look how much we growing in numbers and stuff. The Lord's blessing us. We getting schools across seas and all that stuff. Scripting numbers, blah, 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 blah. They try to actually bring up the stats and all that kind of stuff as a reason for me not to leave. So they will do that. Don't be blindsided by that or what you see. All right. So if it's not the gospel of Christ and we're telling you me and brother Kim was in it, brother faithful. No, he's, he's devoted a bunch of time into studying. G con. No, he was in it. Brother surreal devoted a lot of time studying it. A lot of other brothers out there in the live chat, they put time in to look into this doctrine that these guys are teaching. And we're telling you as firsthand experienced people that it's a heresy and that you need to come out because you doggone right, you're cursed. But it's not because of Deuteronomy 28. It's because you're preaching a false doctrine, a false gospel, damnable heresies. Leading people astray, putting them on the broad road, leading to destruction instead of the narrow path that leads to life. So that's why we speak the way we do. That's why we do these hangouts to, hope, to give you guys this information, show you from people who was inside this movement and lived it and had the same mindset as the people y'all deal with when y'all go in the streets. And the guys that's making these videos, we was them guys. I was them guys a year and a half ago. I was just like them, saying that stupid bringing up food stamps and all other stuff. I was doing all that. So we let you know by firsthand experience that it's a heresy, and that you brothers and sisters need to come out of there and leave this doctrine alone. Leave it alone. What you are in the, in the spirit, what spirit you're born of, is what matters. Not who you are in the flesh. Because a lot of you will hold on to it because you will say, well, if it's not us, then who is it? You need to understand the gospel and, and realize, number one, in the, in the grand scheme of salvation, it doesn't matter who it is. Because if you're not born in the spirit, both Jew and Gentile will be destroyed. That's the grand scheme of things. But in that also, God does have a literal fleshly Israelite lineage that are literally children of Abraham that is on the earth. And if you're twisting scriptures, because if you twist one, you by default have to twist others to keep your narrative going. And if and we've already shown in these three or four or five verses so far, that is not what the black Hebrews are talking about on the streets. So imagine what else they've twist. So with that being the case, we bring out this information. You brothers and sisters, look at this. Go back over the video and, and ask the Lord to open your mind. Apply what James 1 and 5 says. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. But let him ask in faith, not wavering. But if you waver when you ask of God, don't receive anything. Don't uh, don't expect to receive anything from God. For we know that without faith, it's impossible to please him. So he's not even, he's not going to listen to you if you don't ask in faith. So ask the Lord to open your mind to the scriptures, show you what the scriptures really mean. I thought that ego was talking about a symbol just as Kimmywell did. But as we read through the scriptures, it's plain to see. He's not talking about a national symbol that's an eagle, but the characteristics of the eagle that he created. That's what he said, as swift as the eagle flyer. So you brothers and sisters, look at all that and come out of that, that, that movement because it's not the gospel of Christ. That's why you walk around with these hateful spirit and prideful spirits, which are not, which are just workings of the flesh. That's the type of the fruits that you guys are bearing. A lot of you just been deceived. You really want to serve God just like I did. I thought it was the truth. Or this truth, like IUIC like to say, you know, this truth. Who woke up to this truth? 
just like you know nation islam says woke up to this truth not it's this so truth good. but the truth which is christ so go ahead, go ahead bro now i was saying that the so-called truth right? right in the case of iuic right so-called truth they're not even in the truth they're in the lie that's what makes it crazy exactly um you want you want to say something i just saw something in the side chat yeah you know i think uh we could probably wrap it up with this man um yeah. i mean I, it's up to you my brother you know uh yeah, matthew 23 37. yeah oh you want to pull it up? you know what i'm saying yeah. yeah and um i mean if you could go ahead and read that and uh to show exactly what how you are seeing some of the one westerns are doing because this is this is this represents what they do unfortunately you know we're not saying this because we, we we hate them we say this because we care about them we we love them and care about their souls we don't want them to end up in perdition because of what they're following because of this falsehood what was it matthew what again you know 23 and uh uh what is it matthew 23 and oh uh 27 excuse me 27. <clears throat> All right, so Matthew 23, verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even, right, because, yep. No, I was going to say because that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to give the outward appearance of holiness. You know, to be seen of men. Remember, that's why they had to broaden their uh, phylacteries, right? Uh, or no, no, enlarge. No, no, no. Yeah, they wanted to uh, make large the phylacteries or broaden the the um, uh, the, the the edges of, of the. Uh, hold on, it's right here in the same chapter. Let me pull it up. And when it says it in uh, twenty three and five, right where it says that they wanted to, yeah, broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Right. And they were doing that to be seen of men, right? Because they wanted to give off the impression, oh, look, we're holy. We're so special because we're doing this, you know, outwardly. Yeah. But inwardly, what were they? It was like the cup. Remember Christ constantly told them that they wanted to make the outside of the cup clean, but it was the inside of the cup that matters. And the camps don't realize it, but that's really what they're doing. They're trying to give off the veneer. But even even that veneer is, is 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 horrible, right? Like the stuff that they believe, the the belief that Jesus is Adam and Solomon reincarnated. Come on, man! Like like just just utter heresy, and, and that's just one small thing, believe it or not, of the many things that they have that are wrong. And we just hope and pray that the Lord will remove the scales off their eyes and convict them and and to uh, get them to to see the folly that they're in, so that they would repent. And come out of it, you know, and come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Right. So <clears throat> we're gonna go ahead and end it right here, brothers and sisters. Thank y'all again for coming through. It's your brother Jay, SOG, brother Kenwell, SOG, soldiers of God, brother Faithful to God, SOG, soldiers of God. You know, we hear you guys go and subscribe to uh brother faithful page, faithful to God. You guys look that up on YouTube. Of course, uh, most likely if you're here watching this, you're probably already subscribed to my channel, but if not. Uh, you guys gonna hit that subscribe button, uh, brother J B R O T H A, and then the letter J. And uh, Lord's will, we'll be talking to y'all soon in another hangout. Peace, your brothers and sisters in the faith, continue in the faith. Peace. <laughs>